Theology Lecture Series. This is our eighth lecture series, and it's sponsored by the Rossi Family Foundation and Department of Kinesiology. And I'm Dr. Jimmy Bagley. I'm hosting today, and this is Mr. Ryan Dirk. He'll be introducing our speaker. So I get the pleasure of introducing our lecturer for today. Uh, he did his PhD at Ball State University, where he studied muscle physiology and bioenergetics. He then went on to Tufts to his postdoc, where he was looking specifically at nutrition and aging, which we'll talk about more today. There, he also published another paper expanding the gut muscle access hypothesis to the aging population. And now he currently resides at Georgia Southern University, where he gets to mentor both undergraduates and graduate students alike. He, aside from his academic accomplishments, is also an elite amateur athlete. He's participated in tons of endurance athletes and is sponsored by over four different companies. And aside from just his athletic and academic performances, he's one of the most eloquent academic writers I've ran into. So please welcome Dr. Greg Grossi. Thank you much for that kind introduction, Ryan, that uh, I probably won't be able to live up to up here. Uh, thank you guys very much for coming. I know it's Friday before spring break. I really appreciate you guys being here. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about my research over the past six to eight years. Um, and my, my talk is going to be entitled, Exercise and Nutritional Interventions to Combat Fatigue from Athletes to Aging. And I'm going to take you through some of the research I did during my doctoral work at Ball State looking at single muscle fibers and the contractile function of them with aging, and then kind of bridge that through the current research I'm doing in my lab today, which is more focused on the gut microbiome and how that contributes to human performance from both a health and wellness perspective, as well as to athletics. And, and I, I look forward to talking to you guys about that today. So I would be amiss to begin any discussion of fatigue without bringing us back to the original study of fatigue in the original fatigue laboratory. And some of you may have learned about this. I know Dr. Bagley does a great job with his undergraduate exercise physiology. And that's the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory. And so the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory was started in 1927 uh, at Harvard by, by biochemist L.J. Henderson. He's up there in the top left corner. And actually Stanford grad biochemist David Bruce Dill, or D.B. Dill, and, and the, the tenure of the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory went from 1927 to 1947. And this was the first laboratory devoted to the comprehensive study of man. And so the real primary function of this laboratory, or their primary research interest, was to improve workplace safety and workplace hygiene in a time when there were a lot of people working in factory settings that might have been dangerous. But as an aside, due to their own kind of personal interest, they also dabbled and, and really studied a lot of human performance with the goal of making endurance and, and work capacity both more tolerable and more enjoyable for human beings. It was also at this laboratory that in 1939, Sid Robinson published some of the first data kind of looking chronologically at human aging. And he studied cardiorespiratory fitness in individuals from 6 to 91 years of age. And it was Sid Robinson's work that actually discussed that declines in heart rate and declines in VO2 were some of the primary factors contributing to reductions in aging, in, in health with age. Now something that's kind of interesting, if you look at the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory, all of these wonderful and great scientists agreed that the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory was a great name for this laboratory. What they couldn't agree upon, however, was a universal definition for fatigue. And so that brings me to the next slide in my lecture. What is fatigue? We all know what fatigue feels like, right? It's Friday afternoon before spring break. You all have endured probably a long uh, semester. Maybe you just took Dr. Bagley's test and you're tired and you're feeling fatigued, right? But, but, but how would we define fatigue? So my personal experience studying or maybe experiencing fatigue started during my sophomore year at the College of William and Mary. I was a runner uh, my, my, my first year of college, and then I switched to cycling because of injuries. As, and as a runner, most of our, uh, our training bouts would last an hour or maybe an hour and a half in length. And I was pretty arrogant. I joined the cycling team and thought I was going to be able to show some cyclists how to ride a bike. What I was totally unprepared for was going out for an 80-mile ride, which should have taken four hours and ended up taking five or six. 
because I foolishly brought absolutely no nutrition whatsoever. So it was about 40 miles into that ride in Richmond, Virginia, 40 miles from home, I realized I was so fatigued I could barely turn the pedals over, not having taken such a wonderful class in exercise physiology and studied substrate utilization. It was the next year when I took that exercise physiology class and was able to apply what is going on as an athlete to what I'm learning in the classroom that really stimulated my interest and made me think, wow, like studying exercise and studying science and studying fatigue for the rest of my life sounds like an actual pretty cool idea. So if we go to the literature, we'll see that there's a myriad of definitions still for defining fatigue. Roger Anoka at the Integrative Physiology Lab at CU Boulder defines fatigue as a transient decrease in the capacity to perform physical actions. McIntosh and Rassier in this, in this well-written paper in 2002 define fatigue as a circumstance where less than the anticipated contractile response is obtained. Sandra Hunter from Marquette, who studies fatigue, defines it as an exercise-induced decline in maximal voluntary muscle force or power. And then perhaps most importantly, yours truly recently defined it as a decline in performance associated with activity. And so I think we probably need not to get caught up in what exactly is the definition of fatigue. We need to take a lesson from that fatigue laboratory. Rather than get caught, get caught up in defining fatigue, I think we can all agree what fatigue looks like and, and understanding fatigue, right? And so this has really become the crux of my research. We know older adults, I feel like we can all agree, older adults are highly fatigable. But athletes, these are probably the individuals who are going to be the most fatigue resistant or the, less fatigue, the least fatigable. So what can we learn from athletes that we can apply to older adults to make, their, to make them less fatigable and to improve their lives from a health and wellness perspective, right? So that's what I'm going to try to answer with my research questions. But I want to start off talking about muscle, right, the coolest organ in the, in the body. Muscle mass peaks between the third to fourth decade of life, as we can see up here, followed by a gradual decline of approximately 1 to 2 percent per year or 10 percent per decade. And this is a condition known as sarcopenia, the age-related loss of muscle mass. Concomitant with that reduction in muscle mass is a decline in muscle strength. And while we're often taught and, and maybe think that the, the primary reason for the decline in strength with age is a loss of muscle mass, this data here shows that there's actually quite the divergence and that muscle, muscle strength I'm sorry, is lost much more precipitously than the reduction in muscle mass. And greater yet is the age-related decline in muscle power. And this is perhaps most relevant to older individuals who need to stop themselves from falling, right, and to preserve their ambulatory capacity in the built environment. And so we can look at this delta or this, this difference between the age-related loss of muscle mass and the age-related loss of strength and power. And this is a term that, that uh, gerontologists and aging muscle physiologists will use to, to, to categorize what they call muscle quality. And this is the function of muscle over its size. And emerging data is beginning to suggest that age-related declines in muscle quality may have even greater bearing on physical function, disability, falls, and death than the age-related loss of muscle mass itself. And so the purpose of my doctoral work, I really wanted to study the, the contribution of muscle quality to age-related skeletal muscle health. And so I did that at Ball State using the single fiber approach, which is where I met Dr. Bagley. And so we would do muscle biopsies in people uh, spanning the gamut of age. And we would uh, isolate, I'm gonna, as I'm going to show in this video here. So here's a, a bundle of, of muscle fibers from a muscle biopsy, right? Hundreds, if not thousands of muscle fibers in that bundle. So we'd isolate these individual muscle fibers and then tie it there between a force transducer you're seeing and a motor arm on the other side. And then we would study it much like you guys would study a whole muscle in the gym, right? You could measure whole muscle size with an MRI or CT scan or even a tape measure, right? And we would also study its strength, its speed and power, much as you guys could do with a biodex dynamometer or possibly just some free weights. And so that was really the, the focus of my doctoral work and my dissertation was looking at what is the effect of the aging process on muscle fiber quality. So here you see yours truly studying single muscle fiber you can see there on the background of that screen. 
Uh, there's a picture, a schematic of, of that muscle bundle, a strip of that muscle from a muscle biopsy. We'd tie it, again, between that force transducer and that motor arm, as you saw in that previous video. And then, as I said, we would study it much like you would a whole muscle right for its size, strength, speed, and power. We would integrate power as a product, right, of strength and speed. So we would use those to calculate power. And the primary variable we were interested in is normalized power. And so we decided this is a key index of muscle quality. And normalized power was the power that that muscle fiber could generate divided by its size. So this is akin to looking at VO2 max from a relative perspective, right? If, if, if I have a VO2 max of 5 liters and Dr. Bagley has a VO2 max of 5 liters, Dr. Bagley perhaps weighs a bit more than I do. And so we make it rel <laughs> he's furious. Yeah, it's probably the case. <laughs> the run this morning would suggest it's the case. Uh, and so we're making, we're making that the power that that muscle fiber can generate relative to the individual, right? And in this case, we're making it relative to the individual muscle fiber. And so that's the variable we focused on. And so I'm going to start by showing you some data that, that preceded my dissertation work. And then I'm going to, I'm going to build that in uh, in the context of the single muscle fiber literature. So here we have on this y-axis, we have normalized power, right? That's our muscle quality variable. And we wanted to focus on the fast type 2 type 2A muscle fibers in particular. And these are the muscle fibers that are affected most by the aging process. And so our research question was, what happens to type 2 muscle fiber power? These are the muscle fibers that are the powerful muscle fibers, right? These are what we're going to use to stop ourselves from falling and to perform quick and powerful movements. And so the research question is, what happens to the, to the normalized power, the quality of these type 2 muscle fibers with aging? And so here we see type 2 muscle fibers in individuals, cross-country runners, and young healthy participants about 25 years of age, and it's, it's about 8 watts per liter. Here we see normalized power of, of runners and healthy individuals about 45 years of age, and we see little change really in, in the power of our muscle fibers going from 25 to 45 years of age, which is akin to what we may see at the whole muscle level, at, at least hopefully those of us are getting older. Not a big reduction in, in strength or power between 20 and 40 years of age hopefully. So preceding my, my dissertation work, there was a paper published by Dustin Slivka in 2008. And this was an 80-year-old males, or I'm sorry, 80-year-old females. And he saw normalized power in these muscle fibers of these 80-year-olds these that was close to 12 watts per liter. So significantly higher than was being seen in these 20 and 40-year-old individuals. And so we asked the question, well, was Dustin just bad at the single fiber technique? Or is there actually something going on here with these aging muscle fibers. And hopefully, oops, sorry, hopefully it wasn't just Dustin and I, because in these 90-year-olds, we saw type 2 muscle fiber power that was more than twice as great as we saw in these 20 and 40-year-old individuals at 17 watts per liter. So we went into the literature and we said, can we find any data in humans showing type 2 muscle fiber power of 17 watts per liter? And we were able to find one paper and it was on one person, and he happened to hold the world record in the 100-meter hurdles. He was a champion sprint runner. We can see that the type 2 muscle fiber power in those 90-year-olds was actually quite similar to what was seen in this champion sprint runner. And the other bar there is people with spinal cord injury who also have a remarkably high type 2 muscle fiber power. So this gets you scratch in your head when you set in to study type 2 muscle fibers with aging hoping that their quality is going down, so we need to fix the quality of these type 2 muscle fibers in these 90-year-olds, right? But that's not what the data showed. So we thought, what is going on in skeletal muscle, particularly at the cellular level, during the aging process that might, that might precipitate, it might stimulate this improvement in type 2 muscle fiber power? Right? We know with the aging process, our fast fibers get smaller. And we actually lose almost half of our muscle fibers between 20 and 80 years of age in our leg muscle. We lose almost half of those muscle fibers. So possibly what's happening, we, have, we know aging muscle is smaller, but possibly what's happening is we have a survival of the fittest phenomenon at play. And that is that as we lose half of these muscle fibers, it's only the best, most powerful muscle fibers sticking around. 
This phenomenon has similarly, similar, similarly been proposed to occur with individuals with spinal cord injury, which we saw on the previous slide. And then if we have to think about it, if we have such a limited number of muscle fibers, perhaps their frequent use, maybe 90-year-olds aren't necessarily running or cycling or lifting for 45 or 60 minutes a day, but they are getting out of their chair, they're walking to the fridge, right? They're moving around. These were individuals who are still ambulatory. They didn't have any uh, overt mobility disability. So the muscle fibers they have are being relied upon for almost every task, right? So perhaps that frequent use is precipitating even greater improvements in the quality of these muscle fibers. Kind of interesting. But I want to go back to that comparison of comparing muscle fibers and maybe someone who's 90 or even 100 years old to that of a champion sprint runner. Perhaps they do have similar, similar fast muscle fiber quality. But our champion sprint runner is clearing 110 meters of hurdles in 12.9 seconds. Meanwhile, Ms. Keeling, who also has the world record for the 100 meter dash, is taking a minute and 17 seconds. And yes, Jimmy, you're faster than, than Ms. Keeling here. <laughs> Although not for four miles. In a minute and 17 seconds, right? And so perhaps bad statistics to say, I think we would all agree, right, that that would, that would probably be statistically significant, that difference. And so what can we learn as students of physiology and researchers and practitioners and clinicians? And that's that physiological performance in human health is really a product of many physiological systems, right? There will be a lot of researchers that will come talk to you guys, you'll go to conferences, and you'll hear researchers belabor one particular system or one particular pathway or single muscle fibers or myonuclei. Right, Jimmy? <laughs> but if we actually want to understand what's going on at the whole organism level, we need to study and be open to studying a variety of these systems and looking at how they interplay with one another to really understand what's going on at that organism at the whole organ level. At the whole. And so that kind of led me to my postdoc work where I went to Tufts University and I had the fantastic opportunity to work in the Jean Meyer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging. We've all uh, now, I've, I've used the word once, sarcopenia. That term was actually coined by Erwin Rosenberg in 1997 at Tufts University. He worked a few floors beneath me. It's pretty cool. And I, I had the unique opportunity to work with Dr. Roger Fielding, who's a seminal figure in aging muscle health. He, he's well known all around the world. Uh, and I also teamed up with one of his research scientists, Dr. Mike Lustigarten, who's very well known in studying the aging and the gut microbiome. And so this was a fantastic opportunity. I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of the work I did there and my understanding of how, so as I said, we need to study a variety of physiological systems, right? What could seem more distal to skeletal muscle than what's going on in our gut? But not so fast. So starting off looking at the human gastrointestinal tract, we can define it as a hollow series of organs starting with our mouth extending all the way down to the anus. And the gastrointestinal tract is absolutely enormous, estimated to be between 150 to 300 meters squared, which is actually 300 meters squared the size of a tennis court. And so in anatomy, right, perhaps your teacher or maybe in physiology has talked about the relationship between structure and function, and you're like, yeah, sure. You can never think of an applied example. Well, how about this, right? The purpose of the gastrointestinal tract is to be able to absorb as many nutrients as we can. What better way to absorb as many nutrients as we can other than fit 300 square meters inside, inside of our, our human being, right? It, it's pretty phenomenal. In the average human lifetime, the gastrointestinal tract is passing approximately 60 tons of food. And it's home to a variety and a great abundance of microorganisms. And we'll call these organisms, these bacterial species, microbiota. And, and these are primarily implicated in digestion and immune defense. So we're going to discuss a little more their, their, their being and their relation in these slides. So I said I studied the gut microbiome and gut microbiota. And so gut microbiota are the bacteria, archaea, viruses, and eukaryotic microbes that reside in the gastrointestinal tract. That's the microbiota. 
If you hear the gut microbiome phrase, that's actually looking at the gene expression of these bacteria in our gut. There's, already, there's over 39 trillion or more than 2 kilograms of these bacterial cells in our gastrointestinal tract, right? Almost 5 pounds of bacterial cells residing in our GI tract. And 39 trillion cells, does anyone know how many trillion cells there are that make up the human body? 30 trillion. So we have 9 trillion more, right, bacterial cells in our gut than we do that make up the human body, which makes it pretty fascinating to study. And from an aging perspective, we know that both the composition as well as the function of these bacteria change throughout the lifespan. And these changes have been associated with a number of the most salient and prevalent contributors to chronic disease in society today. Things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. And with this realization in 2008, the Human Microbiome Project was established as a global initiative to characterize and understand how changes in these bacteria in our gut contribute to human health. And so perhaps the most fascinating or interesting or, or early work done looking at gut microbiota focused on metabolism, right? They reside in our gastrointestinal tract, so there's obvious implications for our metabolic function, or at least hopefully. And so this first study done at University of Washington, St. Louis by Back Eden colleagues in 2004 took fecal samples from wild type mice, so these are just your normal lab mice. They harvested that gut, mi those gut microbes, the gut microbiota, and they transplanted them into these white mice right next to there. These are germ-free mice. So these are mice born and raised in totally sterile conditions, and they totally lack a microbiome. And what they saw was that one month after being colonized with the gut microbiota, the, from their wild type litter mates, these mice developed obesity as well as metabolic syndrome. What's more interesting, we see here, so the white bar, these are just our germ free mice, and we're looking at how much food they're eating during the day. ConVD, these are those germ free mice after they've been colonized with the microbiota. And then the ConVR, this bar indicates just food consumption in, in those wild type mice, right? Those black mice. So food intake actually went down after they were colonized with the gut microbiota. And how frustrating when you eat less and body fat goes up. Not only that, but they appeared to develop this metabolic syndrome as was indicated by reductions in insulin sensitivity and reduced glucose tolerance. So this is one of the first studies, it's well known, I believe it has over 4,000 citations in the literature looking at gut microbiota and its implications for metabolism. This was done just 15 years ago. Right. So four years later, Patrice Kenny at Belgium published this conceptual model for just kind of describing or trying to describe what is going on in the gut when individuals eat a high fat diet. So eating a high fat diet is implicated in changing our gut flora, the composition of our microbial ecology. This leads to increased intestinal permeability. So some of you, I, I feel like most of you, have probably heard of the term leaky gut syndrome. That's this increased intestinal permeability. The bacterial contents from inside your gut are spilling out into your circulation. This, one of the primary bacteria contents studied is this lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, also known as endotoxin. And so it leads to this increase and in circulating endotoxin in our, in our circulation. This is going to increase inflammation. Systemic inflammation is going to increase. And then tied to this development of inflammation is a myriad of metabolic disorders and the possible development of this metabolic syndrome and this metabolic phenotype, as we saw reflected in the reduction in insulin sensitivity in those germ-free mice. All right, so that, that backhead study was done in 2004. Nine years later, the same lab at University of Washington, St. Louis, in a study led by Radura and colleagues published in Science in 2013, recruited monozygotic and dizygotic twins that were discordant for obesity. So one twin had a BMI of greater than 30, and then you had one lean twin. And what they did is they took fecal samples and transplanted their microbiome their microbiota into these germ-free mice. 
And can you guess what happened? The mouse, the germ-free mouse receiving the microbiota from the obese twin became obese and developed this metabolic phenotype. And the germ-free mouse receiving the microbiota from the lean twin appeared to be protected. Furthermore, co-housing these, these germ-free mice together appeared to actually have some protective effect of the development of this metabolic phenotype in the germ-free mouse colonized with the microbiota from the obese twin. How cool is that? And so the data shown here actually just shows changes in, in fat mass we see on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have days post-colonization. And so distally here, we see 35 days, or just over a month post-colonization. The red bar, we're looking at the change in fat mass in the germ-free mouse uh, colonized with the microbiota from the lean twin. And the blue bar, we're looking at changes in fat mass colonized with the microbiota from the obese twin. And so as I showed in that previous figure, right, we see little change in fat mass in that germ-free mouse colonized with the microbiota from the lean twin. But meanwhile, the poor mouse receiving uh, the microbiota from the obese twin had an increase in body fat of almost 20%. And so we can dig a little further. What is it about the microbiota from the obese and lean twin that may be doing this? And we see a, a far greater abundance on the left figure here a far greater abundance of disaccharide sugars in the microbiota from the obese twin. And we see, conversely, on the figure here, we see a far greater abundance of metabolic byproducts of microbial fermentation in the microbiome from the lean twin. And so I'm going to explain what that means a little bit in greater detail here further. But one thing I really want to focus on is that there was greater abundance of this, this metabolic byproduct of microbial fermentation, butyrate, in, in the fecal samples from the lean twin. And so what is it, is there, is there something with butyrate that may help offset or protect against the development of obesity and, and metabolic syndrome in the germ-free mouse inheriting the microbiota from the lean twin? And so we have to look in vitro study here. This is a cell culture study done by Pang et al. in 2009. And what they, they wanted to answer the question, how do metabolite differences, particularly looking at butyrate, appear to affect health? And so you, they use this unique cacao 2 monolayer cell model. These are cells harvested from uh, colon carcinoma. And they're commonly used in the literature to understand in vitro intestinal, per, intestinal permeability. Right? And so they took cells and they left half of them in regular media. And they took the other half of these cells and they incubated them in butyrate. And then they measured this trans-epithelial electrical resistance, a higher value, indicating greater tight junction integrity and less permeability in those intestinal cells. So higher value, less permeability. And what they saw is that by incubating these cacao 2 monolayer cells, right, a model of the intestinal epithelium, the intestinal mucosa. In butyrate, they were able to improve the fortification of the intestinal epithelium. So if we go back to that conceptual model from Kani et al. in 2008, it seems as though enriching butyrate in the gut is going to help to ameliorate or attenuate that increase in intestinal permeability and possibly offset the downstream consequences of this deleterious, of this deleterious cycle. Right? So for the purpose of what I did at, at Tufts and in the Human Nutrition Research Center, we wanted to focus on aging. And so how does aging tie into all this? One of the hallmark characteristics of aging at the gastrointestinal level is this gut dysbiosis. So we have that change in the bacterial species in our gut that leads to or appears to trigger an increase in intestinal permeability. So older adults have greater intestinal permeability. And this is measured by looking at levels of this endotoxin or LPS in circulation. If you, if you do a blood draw on an older adult and look for LPS in circulation, its abundance is going to be greater in older individuals. And so because endotoxin levels are higher in older adults, 
This is a, at least one of the factors likely contributing to this process that some of us may have heard of, known as inflammaging, or greater levels of, of circulating inflammation in older adults. At the skeletal muscle level, inflammation is responsible for reductions in muscle size, infiltration of fatty connective tissue, and eventually reductions in muscle function and physical performance that contribute to the development of disability in older individuals. And so this figure here was taken from a review paper showing, kind of highlighting, at least providing a model for how changes in the gut with aging might actually be contributing to reduced muscle function and, and the development of disability in older adults. And so that takes me to my current work now at Georgia Southern in Savannah where I'm looking at exercise and nutritional strategies to target the gut microbiome. The majority of my work to date has been with exercise, but I want to start off with something, a term, uh, particularly looking at nutrition, right? Because that's certainly a way we can target or possibly change the gut microbiome. And so there's a term many of us are, are probably familiar with that comes to mind when we think of, of gut and gut bacteria, and that's a probiotic supplement. So this is defined by the World Health Organization as live strains of selected microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer a benefit to the host. And so we can take probiotics, right, as pills. Some of us, many of us in here have probably drunken or consumed some kombucha, right, or you ate your yogurt this morning. Those are all live bacterial strains that, that may or may not improve our health. And the study of probiotics is really emerging in the field over the past two decades. And we can see that in 2018, there were almost 2,500 mentions of probiotics in the scientific literature, where back before the year 2000, they were almost totally unheard of. And so what have these studies found? Well, first and foremost, and possibly important for most of us who don't have access to a lot of uh, animal work and are working in humans, the vast majority of studies in the literature looking at the effectiveness of probiotics to improve muscle health have been in animal models. So Bindles in 2012 published a paper looking at mice that exhibited this cachectic phenotype and showed that probiotic administration was actually able to reduce circulating inflammation in these mice. The same studies show that concomitant with this reduction in inflammation was actually an improvement in muscle size, independent of any exercise. Probiotic administration by Ma and colleagues in 2008 improved insulin stimulation, so improving insulin sensitivity, right? And, and mice fed a high fat diet. And then perhaps most relevantly, Chen uh, recently, just three years ago in Nutrients, published a paper again in Animal Models showing that probiotic administration was actually able to improve grip strength in these mice. But again, this is all done in animal models, and so you have to think about the doses being administered, right? Maybe way greater than what's going on in humans. And so I think there's certainly impetus based on these studies to look at can probiotic administration improve human performance, particularly with aging. And there's been a few studies, mostly in young, healthy individuals, and their results are are, are somewhat mixed, but there's certainly room for more research, and there's more research needed. Uh, and I believe the, the NIH has even administered uh, a RFA or a request for, for funding announcements for studies looking at, at probiotic supplements because of these, these promising results that have been shown in, in animal models. So now I get to talk about the fun stuff, and that's looking at exercise and the work that I've actually got, gotten to do in collaboration with some of you all here. So at the same time I was studying aging and gut microbiota at Tufts, uh, Dr. Bagley and, and Ryan, who was working with, were working with uh, Dr. Bagley, had this great idea for a thesis project. And they said, do you think it's possible that the gut microbiome may be related to fitness level? And so we just used a super rudimentary measure of fitness level. Is the gut microbiome related to VO2 max? Right? Certainly a, an interesting research question, and, and it, 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 it's, it's quite resourceful, right, using the facilities we have here. And so they, they did a great job. They recruited 40 healthy 
young adults approximately 25 years of age. I'd say that's a heck of a master's thesis when you can recruit 40 participants. Right? It's a great job. And they looked at the relationship of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes, which are at the phylum level of the taxonomic rank, and many other variables. So cardiorespiratory fitness. Was this F to B ratio related to VO2 max? Nutritional intake. This was self-reported nutritional intake. And then anthropometric characteristics of this subject. And so a lot of the literature would say that, yeah, you're going to find a lot of findings with nutrition. Right? It's going to be totally related to what these people eat. Well, very curiously, the only significant relationship we found was that VO2 max explained 22% of the variance in that Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio. And from now on, I'm going to refer to that as the F to B ratio. But 22% of the variance in our gut bacteria is explained by our fitness level. And so for all of us interested in exercise, and exercise is medicine, right? How powerful of a statement is it that just our fitness level is affecting the composition of this two kilogram mass of bacteria we harbor in our gastrointestinal tract? I think that's really neat. So then we can ask the question, why does microbial ecology appear to differ in individuals with differing fitness levels, right? So we can look at this paper from Oscar Jukendrup, a world leader in sports nutrition. And he studied triathletes, particularly Ironman athletes. And he tracked them for two hours after finishing one of these Ironman events. So this is an event taking 10, 12, 14, maybe even 16 hours. It's a grueling endurance feat. Right? And he measured that LPS. We talked about LPS previously. We're measuring it in circulation. He measured LPS levels at rest immediately post one hour and two hours after completing that Ironman. And what he saw is that one hour after finishing that Ironman, more than two-thirds of these Ironman athletes had LPS levels greater than five picograms per milliliter. And this is borderline like a clinical concern. Right, this is extremely high uh, levels of LPS. And that high levels of LPS are correlated with gastrointestinal distress, which is experienced in 93% of these athletes. Go figure, right? Uh, impairments in insulin sensitivity, reductions in performance, and prolonged recovery. And so if we think that, OK, endurance exercise seems to be encouraging increased intestinal leak, then we can make the hypothesis that potentially Differences in mi microbial ecology with people, with persons of, of different fitness levels, might help to protect against exercise-induced microbial leak. And it wasn't long after we came up with this hypothesis that we got our answer. Jacob Allen and, and Jeffrey Woods at the University of Illinois published this great training study where they recruited healthy young adults, uh, half uh, some, some uh, regular weight and some were, some were overweight. And they exercise trained them for six weeks. You can see the rest of the details there. As you might expect, lean mass improved and fat mass decreased in these individuals. And VO2 max also changed in the ballpark of about 10% after six weeks of cycle ergometer exercise. So this is, this is the kind of body composition as well as cardiorespiratory fitness adaptations. But let's get into what we're really interested right, in, right? What happened to the bacteria in their gut? And what we see here, if we look at on the y-axis, we have total bacteria, the total percent of bacteria in their gut. And on the x-axis, we have pre and post. The gray line is my obese subjects, and the black line is my lean subjects. And this figure looks at changes in butyrate producers, right? We've heard butyrate. This is helping fortify the intestinal epithelium, right? Butyrate producers increased in their abundance after that six weeks of training. And most importantly, there was actually more butyrate in the gut of these individuals after six weeks of training. And so these data suggest that exercise training induces both, both uh, compositional and functional changes in the gut that appear to be somewhat dependent on obesity status. And so this kind of was a, was a great longitudinal confirmation of the hypotheses that we made based on our cross-sectional data, that indeed exercise training does appear to, to alter the composition of gut bacteria. And so that brings us to uh, our current work. I'm very excited to present this data. No one else 
has seen it, not even my wife. Uh, and so none of this stuff is published, right? So, so I, need to, I need to lead off with that. None of this data is published. It's all still in the works. We've had this super unique opportunity to study this world-class ultramarathon runner. To give you some idea of his credentials, he's a two-time winner of the Havelina 100 and last year set the course record. In 2017, he was the USA Track and Field Ultra Runner of the Year. In 2016, he finished third place at the 100K World Championships. And he was a two-time NCAA All-American cross-country runner in college. So this is, this is an elite, world-class runner. And the goal of this current investigation is to look at how both at baseline and over the course of the 2019 season, his body composition, cardiorespiratory fitness levels, and gut microbiota change. So I'm going to present some of that data now. We'll start off by looking at body composition. His initial DEXA scan, which we took about a month and a half ago, he was kind of in his preliminary or startup phase in his training, right? He had taken a little bit of time down, not totally off, but taken some downtime after his 2018 season. And he had a body fat measured by DEXA of 14.8%, which is about 60% lower than would be expected of a, an age match individual. He's 32 years of age. And he had a VO2 max of just under 67 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is 50% higher than would be expected in an aged match control. Something that I thought would be particularly pressing or interesting to look at was this individual's running economy, right? He's running for 14, 16, 18, maybe even 20 hours at a time. So it's, it's, it's highly relevant and important that he be super economical and efficient in his running. And so for those maybe not familiar with this term, we're looking at the relationship between oxygen consumption, right, or how much fuel or energy it takes for him to run to move at given speeds. So I'm going I'm to adapt this, this nice figure taken from, by, from Jack Daniels' paper in 1991, where on the x-axis we have different running speeds, 6-minute mile, 5.30 mile, and then a 5.11 mile, right? That last bar, he's running around a track at just over 77 seconds a lap. And, and here's the data Jack Daniels published in 91 from Olympic runners, right? So the lower the value, the more economical. He's, getting, he's moving at a, at a given rate. For less, for less energy, right? Here's that data from that ultra marathon runner, just over those Olympic runners. So this is certainly remarkable running economy. And, and to put this in perspective, there's a triathlete I know who also consumes about 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute. But when he does it, he runs at about an eight minute mile. These individuals are moving at a six minute mile or about 30% faster than this triathlete, who's grateful that you guys have invited him here, because he certainly doesn't have a career with this type of running economy or efficiency value, right, compared to these marathon runners. So they're moving at a six minute mile, I'm moving at an eight minute mile for the same oxygen consumption. So it's, it's absolutely remarkable to watch this, this fellow run, it, he floats. So now we get into the exciting stuff, we get to look at what was the microbial signature of this individual? And I want to start off at the phylum level, which is what we did uh, for Ryan's study. And I want to go back to Ryan's study real quick, where we showed that at the phylum level, VO2 max explained 22% of the variance in this F to B ratio. And something I want to pull out or bring out is that average F to B ratio in this study was 0.94. And so to study the microbiota of this ultra marathon runner, we've teamed up with Ubiome. And, and they give us these phenomenal reports using their Explorer profile, looking at characterizing the bacteria at all the taxonomic ranks. But th this particular figure, we're looking at the phylum level, where we see that these firmic firmicutes composed over 78% of his bacteria at the phylum level. And his bacteroides made up just over 10. So that gives us an F to B ratio of 6.98 compared to 0.95. If you were to graph that, you have to make this massive line break in the y-axis. And so we can say that this individual's microbiome from these data is, is totally off the charts. And so to get, to get greater insight into what is it that makes this individual's microbial signature so unique, 
perhaps it would be worthwhile to look at what are the bacteria most prevalent at the genus level. So I'm going to show you the top five of 228 bacteria identified. And this is just our baseline visit, right? This is before the heavy training. What are the top five bacteria that, that you Biome Explorer was able to identify? All right, so these are them. We have Blaudia, Fecal Bacterium, Alloprivatella, Roseburia, and Anerostripes. So let's look at the first one, Blaudia. All right, we think about an ultramarathon. We think about the caloric deficit accrued, right? Six, seven, eight hundred calories per hour for 15, 16, 17, 18 hours. What would make sense? Well, a gut that can digest complex carbohydrates. And a quick PubMed search will show that Blaudia is intricately involved in the digestion and absorption of complex carbohydrates. Three of the next five of these bacteria are all responsible for producing this. Any idea what this might be? It's butyrate. Exactly. So, and alloprevotella is actually inversely associated with cardiovascular disease risk. So if we look at this individual's microbial signature, right, it's certainly setting him up for success in his endurance expedition. And so from these baseline data, I think we can establish what are the apparent requisites for world-class ultramarathon performance. You need a body fat percentage that's 60% lower than average, a VO2 max 50% higher than average, the running economy of an Olympian, and a microbial signature that's literally off the charts. We feel very fortunate to be working on this project and we look forward to continue tracking these physiological characteristics as this individual partakes in this highly specific training and approaches his key event, which is actually the Western States 100, which is kind of like the Super Bowl of ultra marathon running. So how can we relate this and, and what, what kind of future directions can we go from here? So we showed in that Allen data, or, or Allen showed, that people who were obese didn't appear to have quite the same uh, microbial alterations, beneficial microbial alterations, as those who were lean. So is there a way that we can potentiate the beneficial effects of aerobic training at the gut microbiome level? Perhaps something like na nasal breathing and increased activity of the vagal nerve, which is going to reduce inflammation in the gut, might help to stimulate greater microbial uh, milieu changes. What about high intensity or sprint interval training, right? Most of these training sessions are taking 30, 45 minutes or even an hour long. Would high intensity or sprint interval training precipitate or stimulate the same changes in the gut? How about resistance training? Would that lead to changes in our gut? And then finally, can we use exercise training as a therapy for people with gut disorders? And so the title of my presentation was, right, was learning what we, and my purpose of my research that I told you about was learning what we can from athletes and apply it to aging. So we know with aging, I've talked about, there's a lot of changes in the gut microbiome. But two of the ones that now you are familiar with, and I can actually say, is that we see a change in this, this F to B ratio with aging. And we also see a reduction in butyrate producers. Both of these are well known and, and shown and characteristic of the aging gut. So what's an easy strategy to change the F to B ratio and increase butyrate producers? Exercise. And so if we prescribe exercise or get older adults or middle-aged adults to exercise, can we help promote successful aging? Can we make these older individuals more like athletes, more like my 86-year-old grandpa who skied a black diamond every year for the past decade. I want to thank you guys for your time. Thank you for being here. Uh, I need to thank my lab. This is them at Southeast ACSM. And then again, you guys for, for having me. It's been wonderful talking to you. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>